Father, we do thank you for this evening and for the joy it is to gather in your name with the Spirit, binding together the men and women in this room as one in the body of Christ. We praise you for that. And uh, it's Father, the Word, you've given it to us so that we'd know you, that we'd hear you, follow you, and obey you, and glorify your name in all that we do. Let that be the outcome of our study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Where we left off, Paul and Barnabas are returning to the synagogue. They did this because they were asked to come back where they had been a week earlier preaching. Now they're back a second time, or at least they've they've come back with the intent to preach. But as we saw last week, that second trip to the synagogue resulted in the Jewish leadership in jealousy, contradicting Paul's teachings, blaspheming what Paul is saying as they're hearing him speak in the synagogue on this day. So as Paul declares Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, they're contradicting him in the moment, saying, no, he wasn't. He was a murderer. He was a, he was a nothing. And that would be blasphemous, of course. Now, the Jewish leaders in the moment are unaware that their own statements are blasphemous, obviously. They think they're saying the right thing. But nonetheless, they are. And as a result of the mistreatment of Paul and of the message of the gospel, Paul declares, as we left last week, that they were judging themselves unworthy of eternal life. And we moved past that, and really the night was over about this point as I reached that verse last week, so we sort of summed up the moment and we moved out. And now that we come back into it, I want to take a moment before we move on to the rest of this chapter and into 14, to take a moment and consider what Paul just said. What does he mean when he said those words at the end of chapter 13? Verse 46 of chapter 13. Since you repudiate it, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Is Paul implying that they have not earned eternal life? Unworthy. What does unworthy mean? Well, clearly, you can't interpret unworthy here to mean that they have somehow failed to earn their salvation because that would be in complete contradiction to all that Paul teaches elsewhere in Scripture. Paul himself is is the one who wrote on numerous occasions, as you probably know, That salvation only comes by faith in Christ and not by works. Most classically in Ephesians 2, 7, 2, 8, 2, 9. So if we know that Paul's not contradicting himself and Scripture never contradicts itself, then how do you interpret, how do we come to understand what Paul means when he says they're unworthy of eternal life? What does it mean in this context? Well, usually you have to go to the Greek to really get down to it, and we do in this case. The words there for unworthy in Greek are literally two words. Un, uo, and the word axios. Un, axios. Un is the negative prefix no or not, or we would say un, un. It turns what comes next to the negative. Axios has a variety of meanings in Greek. They're all similar, but they're subtly different. And so you have to pick which one of the various meanings are intended here. The English translation I'm looking at, they picked worthy. But... Axios has other meanings. Usually it means fitting or in keeping with or deserving. We get the English word axiomatic from the same root. And axiomatic just means self-evident. Something that is self-evident is axiomatic. When you take the negative of that word, when you take the negative of axios in this context, the meaning becomes something like self-evidently not in keeping with. Self-evidently not in keeping with. And you can see why the English translation would have come to something simpler when they're trying to create a readable version of that statement. So they said not worthy or unworthy. But what Paul's saying is the Jewish leaders had heard the gospel. That's what Paul was preaching. And then they responded with blaspheming. They were repeating the sins of the Pharisees back in Jesus' day when they did that. Remember, Jesus himself declared the kingdom. The Pharisees called him the devil, the son of Beelzebub. That was blaspheming him uh, to his face. What Paul says is, in the way you repeat the sins of your fathers, and then, of course, the result of their father's sin in that respect was Christ judging that generation. Likewise, Paul is saying their response now in the moment to his preaching is self-evident proof that they are not intended to receive the gospel. Their response in blaspheming the truth, self-evidently proves, or the word Paul uses is judges, krinos in the Greek, that they are not 
intended to receive the gospel. They were unworthy in the sense that God had determined not to grant them mercy. That's the sense of the word. That's the sense of the meaning. Now, if you doubt the interpretation, if you're wondering if that's not correct, that interpretation will become very clear here in a minute as we go further in the text and see what Luke does as he contrasts these Jewish leaders and what you hear about them with the Gentiles of the city and what they will now do with the same message. Now watch carefully and look for contrasts here. Verse 48, picking up tonight in chapter 13. Verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. So look at the contrast here. And not just in the end result, look at the contrast throughout the description. In contrast to the Jewish leaders, the Gentiles in the synagogues react very differently to what they just heard. They gladly receive the news of God's mercy through Christ. That is in complete opposition. That is opposite of what the Jewish leaders did. They received the news with jealousy and hatred. The Gentiles glorify the word of the Lord, we're told. What did Paul say about the Jewish leaders a minute ago? They blasphemed it and contradicted it. Finally, the Gentiles who had been appointed to eternal life believed, Luke says. One of the clearest and most powerful affirmations of predestination found in the New Testament. You can't get a clearer statement in the New Testament affirming the biblical truth of predestination. Who is the one doing the appointing in verse 48? It's written in the passive tense, so the subject of the sentence is implied. It's not stated in the text. But the answer is easy because we know what it is that's being appointed. What is the thing being appointed? Eternal life. Who can appoint eternal life but God? It has to be then, the subject of the sentence has to be God in the role of the appointer because what is being appointed can only come from God. So God is appointing certain Gentiles to eternal life. And then notice the order in the text. Because they are appointed to eternal life, they believe. Because they are appointed to eternal life, they believe. Notice the tense. Those who have been appointed, past perfect tense, are the ones who believed in this moment. Present tense to the moment. Their belief didn't create the appointment by their own decision. Rather, Luke says, and makes it very clear here, it was God's divine appointment to eternal life which precipitated their belief in the gospel. Their belief was the result of that divine appointment, not the means. And it's clear because of how Luke uses that truth in the context of a contrast between what the Jews did and how the Gentiles, all who are appointed to eternal life, believed. The Jewish leaders were jealous The Gentiles were joyous. The Jewish leaders were blaspheming. The Gentiles were glorifying. And while the Jewish leaders gave evidence that God had judged them undeserving, the Gentiles gave evidence that they had been appointed to eternal life by the fact that they believed. Luke has taken the two scenes. He's intentionally set them in opposition to make a point. And the point you get from that contrast is the sovereignty of God in the process of salvation, in the act of saving You can see that the difference here was not Paul's preaching style. He didn't even preach twice. He only preached once. Two groups heard simultaneously the same message. And the difference can't be the audience's intellect because the Jewish leaders in the synagogue would have been some of the most learned men in the entire community. In fact, you could argue they had a better chance of believing if it came down to simply intellect. They're the ones who knew the Old Testament, the prophets, the law. They had the benefit of all the Jewish tradition and teaching which the average Gentile would have had none of. So if anything, they should have been better prepared to believe the message. The only difference to explain in the text why one group rebelled and another received was that God rejected one and appointed the other group, or at least some of them. And furthermore, we know from other scripture, this is God's plan from the very beginning. God has long said in the Old Testament that there would be in the day that Christ arrived a rejection by his own people and a receiving by a foreign people. Remember, he said the Jewish people would be given eyes to see not and ears to hear not. And he says elsewhere that God would be found by a people who were not his people. These are all testimonies to God's purposing of this outcome for some greater glory. And he made clear that that would be his intent. And so Luke says, on that basis, the word of God 
was now being spread throughout the whole region to Gentiles principally. Conversations outside of a formal Bible study with friends in the faith who may disagree on this issue usually go poorly, in my experience, because they are removed from the context of clear, deliberate, methodical teaching, and they've been reduced to a a pattern I refer to as Bible bingo. I will pull out the verse, and you'll pull out the verse, and I'll pull out the verse, and you'll pull out the verse, and whoever has the most wins. Rather than a, a dedicated, deliberate effort to understand the entire fabric of Scripture on this issue, and in its context, to see what God Himself in His Word says about how He worked in a given situation, and therefore we can understand a truth from it. That's the only way to understand difficult, complex Bible issues. Absent that kind of diligent effort, we're going to go with whoever taught us first or whoever was most persuasive. Those are not the basis on which to know truth in Scripture. Mistaken, uninformed people can get to you before the educated and understanding people do. Liars are just as persuasive as truth-tellers. The issue is, We are not responsible for saving anyone. So we give a message to everyone and we go where he tells us to go. And water, if you're going to water, plant, if you're going to plant, move on. If you get to reap, that's just the blessing that comes to you once in a while. So let's go to chapter 13, verse 15 and finish out the chapter here. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But... They shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. When the Jews see Paul and Barnabas successfully converting Gentiles to the news, good news of the gospel, it, it had to have been intolerable. The last straw. Not only were they still teaching a truth that angered the Jews and they wanted them to shut up, but the Gentile dogs now, as Jews would have seen them, were actually believing. They were actually the ones now receiving the message, declaring Jesus to be the Jewish Messiah. That would have been too much for them to bear. And so now they stir up two different groups. It's interesting how they do this. You can see the political sophistication for what they did to get this outcome in, in pushing Paul and Barnabas out. First, they, it says they stir up women, devout women of prominence. Devout women of prominence. The word here in Greek for devout is literally God-fearing, and some of your Bibles may say that instead. That tells you who they are. God-fearers is a technical term in Judaism for the proselyte, the the Greek or Gentile who has attached themselves to Israel and is following Jewish law, Jewish custom, and following Jehovah. God-fearers were never Jews. They're always Gentiles. So we're talking about Gentile women who who have an affection for the Jewish people. They are also, it says, prominent. And remember, women are not prominent in their own right, by and large, in this day. They're married to prominent men. That's the, team. That's the, 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 that's the implication here. They're married to the, the fathers of the city, probably, or the businessmen of the city, which is the second group mentioned, the leading men of the city. Those are their husbands, in other words. These are not two separate groups, but in fact, how do you get to the husband? Through the wife. And that's what's happening here. These women are a part of the Jewish culture, though it's probably the case that their men are not. If they're prominent men in a Greek city, they're not likely to have much contact with the Jews. So their wives have gone off and found an interest in this hobby. That's the husband's perspective. But the Jews now go to these women and say, you need to do us a favor by way of your husbands. You need to get these troublemakers out of the city. So they go, they tell their husbands. Their husbands then say, whatever you want, honey. And they run them out of the city. That's how the Jews, in a very sophisticated way, took care of their problem. Remember, they are Jews in a Greek city. They have no power apart from the Greek leaders and the the Gentile leaders. They had to figure out a way to get them on their side. This is how they did it. So they stir up the men of the city against Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas, and then on the way out of the city as they run out, Paul and Barnabas perform this apostolic ritual of judgment, which was prescribed by Christ himself to them before he left. They take off their sandals, we're told, they shake the dust, and they did this literally. You get outside the city and you just, in a symbolic act, you take your shoe off and it'd be covered with dust, and you just shake the dust in the direction of the people or of the city. Jesus gave these instructions in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And it's recorded, for example, in Luke 9, 5. Jesus says, as for those who do not receive you, as you go out from that city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. This was an instruction Jesus gave the apostles specifically and for that day. There is no sense in Scripture that this is now to be a regular church ritual or something that believers follow. It was unique to the apostolic mission. 
Apostolic meant sent with a message. We're talking about the men who were uniquely appointed in the first days and the first years of the church to carry the message to, to the world for the first time. As they encounter it for the very first time, they were under a different kind of commissioning. And as the message of the gospel arrives, there becomes an opportunity for that audience to know the truth. This is the point of the apostolic mission, to carry the message to the world. If the city did not receive them, Jesus says the apostles are to perform this symbolic act. And what it meant in the Jewish culture was it's a form of breaking fellowship. It was not, Jesus didn't invent this ritual. It was already a custom. He took it and made it a part of the apostolic mission, though. And he said, you are to perform this act and, and with all its meaning intact against cities. Now, think about what that means in, the li- in light of where Luke has just taken us a few verses earlier. How can they be so sure, for example, that the city they're being forced, of, forced out of here should have this kind of repudiation applied against it? How do they know that they won't receive the gospel the next guy that walks through the town? Well, perhaps some of the people in the city are still going to receive the gospel one way or another. But as a people group, that town is now not going to receive it. That's right. God has determined that. In fact, think about where the instructions came from. Jesus himself. What he's telling the apostles is when you come into the city and the city rejects you and they kick you out. Remember, we're not talking here about percentages. It's not like a vote. It's not as if he came into the city and if at least 51 percent of you don't believe, I'm going to shake my sandal. No, they've been kicked out. The city pushed them out. When that happens, he says, you can take that as proof that I am not working in that city and you have reason now to shake your dust. You're not determining judgment. You're affirming or witnessing to the judgment I have already shown you that God himself is made evident by this outcome. You see, you flip it on its head. It's not that they created the outcome. They're reacting to it and simply affirming that God has told us through these experience, through this circumstance, that he is not working in the city. We need to move on. What's the benefit in that? They don't waste their time. If God's already made that determination, you can hit your head against the wall all day long, but it's still going to be there when you're done. There's no reason to be there if you know that's not where God intends to work. And that does not say that for all generations, there's no one in that town that will ever believe. It's to say that for the apostolic mission, there's, no, there's not going to be fruit there. Don't waste your time. There's fruit somewhere else waiting. Go where the fruit is. So that's the intent. Despite the rejection, the, the chapter ends with the disciples being continually filled by the Holy Spirit. Think about what that verse is saying. The joy of the early believers was a true spiritual joy found in the relationship they had with the Lord. They're poor. They're persecuted. They're often rejected by their own families. If they were a Jew and they came to faith, they probably lost all contact with their family and with their culture. And yet they're joyful strictly because of their faith, because of what God had done in bringing them eternal life. And their hope in that was enough for joy. Now, how often do we say we're having a bad day or we're experiencing a bad mood? And that's normal. And of course, it's going to be part of the human experience. But it also reveals a weakness in our walk when we do that because the world's emotions and attitudes, they wax and wane with circumstances. Good days are made from good circumstances, bad days from bad circumstances. But a Christian attitude, in light of this verse, should not vary by what happens in the world. Our focus and our source of happiness can't be on the, on the worldly. It has to remain on the eternal heavenly realm. It has to be built on that hope, not on anything that happens here, so that no matter what happens here, it doesn't cause my emotional state of mind to go up or down. And I know that's easier said than done, but the next time you, you may feel the pity party moment coming on when, woe is me, the world's against me, and I can't have a, I can't, nothing works right or whatever, ask yourself this. Are your circumstances worse in whatever moment you're facing than the first century believers who were thrown to a lion's, burned alive at the stake, or even just in the way that they were suffering under this daily kind of persecution and oppression? By and large, I'm guessing the answer to that question is going to be no for most of us. And yet, they're continually filled with joy. Those are the words Luke used. Continually, not occasionally. Filled with joy because of their faith. The point is they have suddenly found something so much more important than anything that they had in this life that those things that come and go in this life are just background noise to what they are experiencing in this newfound joy in faith. You have to work to keep it. And by work, I don't mean manufacture it in a false sense, but work in the sense of where your attention goes and what your goals are in life and what you value in life. You, you know, that's where it has to come from. 
So Paul and Barnabas, they move on to Iconium. That's going to be the next chapter. Before we read the verses that open up verse 14 and just give you a moment of background, Iconium was about 85 miles south of Antioch. Remember, Antioch's on the northeast corner of the Med in present-day Turkey. So they're moving just inland a little bit and south. It was an, a unique town. It was a bastion of Greek culture, largely unpolluted by Romans. You know, the Romans came in after the Greeks had come in centuries earlier and they took over and they Romanized Greek culture. This is a, a city that for most of its existence under Roman authority had become a symbol of resistance to the Romans. They repudiated most Roman culture and influence and they maintained a very Greek style of, in, of life and culture within this little town. It's in modern day town. The modern day town is, is Konoya, Konia in Turkey, if you look it up, K-O-N-I-A. It was situated in an oasis-like setting which befitted its culture, the fact that it was also physically kind of isolated. It's surrounded by deserts, and yet where it is specifically, it's a lush plain, a fertile plain, fertile valley uh, with orchards and farms. And so it's a successful farming community that sells its wares to those who travel through it on a very busy highway. Uh, But outside the city, it's all desert. So it almost felt like it was an isolated little place. And what you're going to see happen now in the town of Iconium, which, as Don just alluded to, it's going to sound very familiar to what you've seen happen so far. Look at verses 1 through 3 to start. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jew and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. So the part that's similar as you open up in chapter 14 is the fact that, number one, they go to the Gentiles, uh, the, the Jews first in the synagogue. Just as always, the gospel goes to the Jew first and then to the Gentile in Paul's day. And they see converts. Here they see out of both groups which I don't think is completely uncharacteristic. I think there's probably been Jews that have believed all the way along, but the predominant belief group is coming out of the Gentiles, of course. But as before, you don't have to go very long in this before the Jews that don't believe get upset and they want to silence the messengers and do something about these two folks who've come into town. And because this was a Greek city, their response here was to appeal to Gentile leaders, much like happened in the earlier town, but here they don't have the prominent women to turn to. They don't have that in, that, that little piece of that leverage they can use. They're just taking it to the leadership on their own. And it apparently does not work because in, in this case here, you do not see them leaving the town yet. You don't see any forced uh, requirement to leave the town. But it does result in the Gentiles in the city becoming embittered toward the believers in the city, toward, toward the, the brethren. Uh, it says here they were stirring up the minds and embittering them toward the, the brethren. The fact that they say brethren here, that means that you have a movement now. You have a church. So the, the bias now is not merely against Paul and Barnabas. It's also against all those who had come to believe. Now they're targets of hostility. Interestingly here, the apostles determined to stay there for a long time despite the opposition in this case. Apparently in this case, the opposition could not force them out of the city like the earlier one could. And that was ultimately the difference and ultimately to the city's benefit because it meant there wasn't any sandal shaking in this case because they were not being forced out of the city. This will be a theme tonight, a little bit of a theme anyway, and that is to this issue of when do you know when you're supposed to stand for the persecution and receive what, you, what comes your way versus when do you flee? So now you have an example where in one moment they're kicked out. Why didn't Paul and Barnabas refuse to leave and just go to the gallows or do whatever came next? And yet here, maybe they were risking that very thing by staying in the city. A little later in this chapter, you're going to see it get even more violent. So when do you know what to do? I'm going to cover that as we get to an answer later in the text. In this case, we get the answer of why they stayed, specifically in this case, right out of the text itself in verse 3. They spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord. With reliance upon the Lord. The point is it was Christ who allowed them to be bold in the face of this opposition, to stand against it, to see the word, the word of grace, as it says, continue to be preached. And he granted, notice it, he granted them signs and wonders as well in the moment. It's apparent that this was a place that despite opposition, they were supposed to stick it out. Begging that question again, when do you know when to stick it out? When do you flee? Coming to that question later, 
let's just notice here we have a wonderful testimony of God's sovereignty again in Luke's narrative. Because look at the difference between Iconium and Salamis, which is the place they just left. In Salamis, the opposition succeeded in running Paul out of town. Here, the result, and of course they got what I'm calling the sandal treatment. Here, they stay. Even though the Jews were basically doing the same thing, this time, Paul is allowed to remain. There isn't enough pressure. There isn't a successful effort to get him out of the city. So he stays here. And it says the Lord made that possible. They relied on the Lord. So we should ask that if we can manage to stay in one city and perform miracles there despite persecution, why did they have to leave the earlier city and shake their sandal off? Why was, why was the opposition successful in one city and not successful in the other city? Is it just left up to human differences? The, the political connections in one city weren't as strong. The opposition wasn't as well organized. I mean, it, it, could that have explained it? Isn't the answer exactly the same answer? Those human answers can be the means by which God makes his distinction known. But they ultimately beg a bigger question of why were one group able to do what the other group was not able to do? And if God's truly sovereign in all things, it gives us the answer. The Lord made it possible in one city while he held off in the other for the sake of that other city, for his own glory. Was Paul's interest different between the two places? Do you think if he had been given the option? I don't see any reason to assume he wanted to be in one place and didn't want to be in the other. So what ultimately dictated whether he was in or not in Salamis? He was booted out. Roman soldiers, more, more than likely, took him by the arms and dragged him outside the city and set him out the city and then said, if you come back in, we're going to kill you and probably waited for him to walk away before they left. What do you do in that case? The only lesson you draw from this is you cannot determine from human experience alone whether you are supposed to persevere or whether you're supposed to leave. You have to have the mind of the Spirit driving you to an answer through your circumstance. And one set of circumstances for one believer could be interpreted one way while interpreted differently for another believer based on how the Holy Spirit is leading them to understand it. So the answer is Paul, in the case of Salamis, understood based on what happened and how the Spirit informed him of its meaning that that was a town he was supposed to walk away from. Versus here, he feels a compelling need to stay in the city despite opposition. It takes us out of the job of trying to create human patterns to substitute for spirit-led life. You can't do that. There's no, there's no mechanism in, in human-led experience that says, every time you see A, B, and C, you're supposed to do D. If there were such a thing, that is the Gentile equivalent of what the Jews did with the law. I don't need to listen to God anymore. I've got this law written on stone. I just have to follow these rules the way I best interpret them, and God doesn't even have to get involved in my life anymore. And that's why we have a law written on our hearts, so that we are completely dependent on him to explain what it is we do in following him faithfully, within the guidance of his word. Okay, so the opposition eventually gets, or they are given the upper hand in this fight, verse 4. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers uh, to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it. And they fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Now here's the question on the table again, right? Once the plot was uncovered to kill Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas decide, you know, maybe we need to leave after all. And they decided to leave. They flee to the surrounding cities to continue preaching. So we have to ask the question, how did Paul know to flee in this moment? When he was willing to face opposition in the earlier moment. Why don't we assume he should just stay in, his, in place and suffer death if necessary to preach the gospel? Isn't that the, the hero mentality we sometimes bring to the thought of, of ministry and to evangelism? I'm going to stand my ground and if they come and kill me for Christ, so be it. Why isn't that Paul's mindset here? The simple answer is, run if you can. Run if you can. There is a difference between being willing to die for your faith and inviting it. There's nothing in the Bible that says you're supposed to invite the opportunity for martyrdom. It says, if it comes against your best efforts to escape it, then accept it. Like James in the jail versus Peter in the jail. Paul was always willing to die. And I think he knew by what God had shown him in his earliest days when he was taken to the third heaven and so on. I think it, by his own testimony, he knew what he was going to have to suffer, which I think means he knew he was going to die ultimately. So Paul lived with that knowledge and he lived with the constant threat of it and the persecution of it. And he was willing to accept it when it came. But he also made every effort to survive, expecting that when the time came for him to die, the Lord would make the outcome such that it was inevitable and he couldn't avoid it. 
So we don't have to invite it a day earlier. We don't have to try to figure out, am I denying God's will by escaping the judgment? Just run if you can. And when God's ready for you to die, you won't be able to run. And then you'll know. If your call is to go somewhere in ministry, and the classic example, of course, is to the other side of the world, right? To the far reaches of some unknown part of the the jungles of wherever. And you don't want to go because you might die there. I think there you may be facing an issue of disobedience to the Lord's call. But if while you're there, all heck breaks loose and you need to get out of there or, or risk your family dying, get out of there. There's nothing unholy in that kind of a process. That's exactly how people stay alive in ministry all the time. But the issue of going there in the first place is the evidence of willingness to keep to the mission God gave. So I don't have to invite my my own martyrdom. I just have to be willing to experience it. Big difference. It's a subtle, but it's a personal kind of understanding. You have to know what God's calling you to do. Now we get, in the last 15 minutes here, we get to one of the more humorous and unfortunately tragic moments in Paul's ministry, but it's got its humor. Verse 8, At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. And this man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leapt up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. So Paul comes to Lystra with Barnabas and and they perform this miracle while they're preaching. Lystra was south again of Iconium and it's opposite of Iconium. It is a very pagan Roman city. It's the worst of the Roman style culture. And, and then Paul, as you see, comes in. He sees his crippled man. From the fact that the man had faith, he can perceive this man to have faith. He calls him to stand in that faith. It's an interesting moment again, right? He didn't say to him, if you have faith, I'll heal you. I mean, it was put to him as you need to stand up because I see in you the faith that you have. And as the man stands, remember, he's crippled from birth. So the miracle here is not only that he heals him, but that he instantly learns to walk. You think about it, if you never had learned to walk, you know, how, how do you know how to do it? The basis for his healing is the faith which Paul surmised and the crowd responds to the side of the healing in, I would argue, in an appropriate way, but an uninformed way. Uninformed. They see the healing as supernatural and they credit it to the work of deity. That's the, nat- that's the appropriateness of it. They see it for what it is. But they wrongly credit it to Roman gods, not to the God. And then, interestingly, and here's where the humor kicks in, they don't run to speak in Greek. They run to speak in their own uh, local language, the Lyconian language, which Paul, as you would expect, doesn't know. Paul and Barnabas only know Greek and probably Aramaic and certainly Hebrew, but they don't understand this language. Probably few people did. It was probably very local, uh, local dialect. And the significance of this is Paul and Barnabas then don't understand what's happening at first when everyone gets excited. I would love to have seen what they were thinking or heard what they were thinking or seen their expressions as all of this kicked off because you have to imagine this took a while, right? The news had to spread. The people had to go tell the priest. He had to go pull the oxen out of the carts and, you know, start the process of sacrifice and all of that. And the whole time, Paul and Barnabas are sitting there wondering, did did they believe what we told them to believe? Is that why they're so excited? Are they mad at us? What is all what's going on? This whole scene is taking place without their ability to appreciate it. Meanwhile, the people have started giving these guys names. Paul, they've named uh, Hermes. Barnabas, they've named Zeus. Barnabas, Zeus, some of your Bibles may say Jupiter. Jupiter is the Roman god. In Greek, Jupiter is Zeus. So Zeus, Jupiter, same, same guy. Statues of Zeus, if you've ever seen, or Jupiter, are of a tall man, bearded, uh, and slightly balding. And that would tell you something then of Barnabas' physical stature and appearance if he's been assigned the name Zeus or Jupiter. They must have, he must be tall. He's probably bearded, as a Jew would be. They say Paul here is Mercury. That's the Roman name for the Greek god Hermes. And they call Paul Hermes, it says, because he spoke the most. And, and Mercury is known as the herald of the gods, the one who did all the, the messenger, the one who did all the speaking. And he was also, by the way, the son of Zeus, which if that suggests anything, and he was also short. 
So if those things suggest anything, Paul was the shorter of the two, maybe the younger looking of the two, and the one who talked all the time. So the people begin to attribute them to these two gods, and then they begin to prepare a sacrifice to these gods. And then as I was reading some background on what may have explained their need to, to jump to sacrifice, I mean, we just take that in, in passing. Oh yeah, these are the gods. Let's go sacrifice to them. Well, that's odd in a way, because even though we naturally just put the two together, in cultural terms, in realistic, real-life terms, sacrifice didn't just happen all the time at the spur of the moment. It was done ritualistically, certain times, certain events precipitated or required it. It wasn't just an everyday thing. So the, it began to raise a question in my mind, why did they immediately run to sacrifice? Why wouldn't they just say, let's have a feast? Let's just hang out with these guys. Why do they think they have to do a sacrifice in the moment? And then reading Dr. Arnold Fruchenbaum's commentary on this one section, he had a great observation. He said, the sudden urge to sacrifice to two human beings who were mistakenly identified as gods, Jupiter and Mercury, can be understood from the background of a legend of Bacchus and Philemon. This legend was recorded by the Roman historian Ovid. The legend says that Jupiter and Mercury came down disguised as men, but no one in the area was willing to provide hospitality to them except one elderly couple named Bacchus and Philemon. The two gods destroyed the local population for its lack of hospitality, but Bacchus and Philemon became the priest and priestess of the temple of Jupiter because of their hospitality, and because of the legend prevalent in that city, and because they had just seen a miracle, they felt that the two gods had come again and not wanting to be destroyed, they were ready to offer sacrifices to him again in this moment. That's a conjecture that I think has some, solid, that has some merit, but it's still not provable. But it is a very interesting element, isn't it? To think that they're really rushing here to, to appease these gods for fear that they'll have this judgment come upon them. Still, Paul and Barnabas are clueless, or at least they're, they're, they're unsure, until they see the animals being prepared. Now, if there's one thing a Jew can recognize a mile away, it's animal sacrifice getting started. So he sees the animal sacrifice process kicking off and goes, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't think they've got the right point because that shouldn't be the normal reaction to the gospel message. And so, uh, and, and I would also imagine somewhere in there they may have begun to sense a kind of, of, of veneration taking place, maybe people being prostrate in front of them, maybe bowing to them or whatever. Something triggered in their understanding what was going on. They eventually, of course, they figure it out. And... In response, verse 14, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things, with difficulty, they restrain the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. So at the news of all that happens, they tear their clothes. That's the classic Eastern message that means I'm, I'm in dismay, I'm, I'm mourning. And they tell the crowds, stop, not to do these things. We're the same guys as you, we're the same men, same nature. And then they reiterate the gospel was being given so that they would not do these things. Its very purpose really was to replace, not encourage, idol worship. So it's really supposed to have the opposite effect. And then Paul says something interesting here. He says the worship of these gods is vain. And if you think about the real meaning of that word, it's a perfect description of what idol worship is. Idol worship is vain in the sense that it's empty and vain in the sense that it's self-serving. Prideful in a, in a way. Because when things are empty, void, prideful, they're describing the futility of worshiping objects made in your own image. The futility of it, the emptiness of it. It goes nowhere, of course. And the fact that you choose to worship something in your own image. What, what were Jupiter and, and uh, Mercury ultimately? Men. They had made gods in their own image. Assigned them special powers and then worshiped them. Total vanity, a vain activity. Paul goes on to say, there is a true God who the Romans have never known. He's the author of creation. And in generations past, he permitted the peoples, the word peoples in Greek refers to the Gentiles specifically. He permitted the Gentiles to go their own way. By the way, that is the definitional distinction of the church age since Pentecost. That before that moment, the Gentile people of the world were largely outside the grace of God. Now, since Pentecost, the Gentiles are the chosen, so to speak, 
I don't mean to suggest that they are Israel, but that they have become the people group whom God is principally working to, to bring the Gospel to while the Jewish people are, are on the sidelines for a time, which allows God to show mercy to a group who did not seek Him, as He says in Romans, a group who did not know Him in previous generations, who He permitted to go astray in previous generations, have now become His uh, intended audience for the Gospel for a time. Until such time as He is done with that uh, age, with that period of time, and He will return His attention to Israel. That switch is what Paul is declaring to these people. That there is now a new moment. He says it this way in Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. He says, Therefore remember that you formerly, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So Paul says he was the one blessed to have had this mission to usher the Gentiles into the family of God. He calls it a a mystery. So here he is showing that to a group of people who react to the news by saying, more of what we already have. It looks like they did manage to stop the sacrifice, but they had to work diligently at it. I don't even know what that looked like. I mean, I'm not sure if it meant they threw themselves over the cow and said, don't cut the cow, or if they... You know, what was it they were literally doing? I don't know. 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, having won over the crowds. They stoned Paul. They dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying... Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in each in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Here we see the first organized opposition to the gospel, though. That's a notable first in the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas had been moving from Antioch steadily southward through this area of Asia Minor, and they keep upsetting Jews everywhere they go. All right, well, that's not news. But now you have a group of Jews who've traveled 90 miles from another city to find Paul and Barnabas so they can continue in the persecution that they had started. So now you've got Jews coming from another city. They're outsourcing their persecution to Jews from other places. And And so as they come into this city now and find Paul and Barnabas doing what they're doing, they convince the people in Lystra that Paul should be killed. And that becomes mob violence. Somehow in the moment they all attack him, they stone him. We don't know where Barnabas is in all of this, by the way. Uh, Apparently he escaped. See, if you can run, do it. Even if you've got to leave somebody behind, I guess. So Paul's left for dead, dragged outside the city. Obviously he wasn't dead. He's, He's unconscious, and that's why they thought him dead. But some believers, some of the brethren, they come to rescue Paul. They're gathered around him, and he's, and he's revived. Now, let's, let's note something in the text. There is no suggestion in the text itself of a miraculous return from the dead, a resurrection, or anything like that. So therefore, the best interpretation is Paul was simply injured, unconscious, not dead. But you could, I think, and I think reasonably you could make this conclusion, the speed with which he revived and went back to work and entered the city and went the next day on a long journey, that suggests at least a miraculous strengthening and revival. And there's nothing wrong with making that suggestion, because after all, the whole point is to see God at work, and that would be one example of it. It's just be careful about assigning too much to what you see, because the text itself doesn't make any specific claim of what God did. Why did he re-enter the city, only to leave it the next day? The answer is because his attackers wouldn't have been there. They're 90 miles back at home. The attackers were out-of-towners themselves. Once they had, they had done what they needed to do, they have no reason to hang around in this town. They think Paul's dead. Let's head back, guys. So the town was actually a pretty safe place from that point of view. Though if he had stayed there very long, he probably would have imagined the bad guys would have heard and come back. So he's there for a night. Then he leaves again. And as Luke himself sums it up, they move around the area. When we come back here next week, we will come back here just for a moment because next week I want to take a second look at the phrase where it says that they tell the believers in the city as they come back in, that they will have to undergo many tribulations in the spread of the gospel. This is a a message, a theme that Luke will really begin to work on through the rest of the book of Acts. He speaks here not only of himself, of course, but it's a statement to the lives of believers in the church. He uses his own example, his life as an example for them in that moment. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the message that uh, 
you leave us with the word every every week, the message in this week of how Paul and, and Barnabas were moving according to the Spirit in and out of cities as you gave them opportunity and direction, spreading the, main, the same message everywhere and trusting you to uh, uh, bring it to the hearts and minds of those for whom it was intended. I pray, Father, that our, our joy and our energies in spreading the good news through our lives and our words would be increased by our understanding of your sovereignty and not diminished, that the fact that you are the one producing faith would be an encouragement to us, for we know in our own power we are so weak at doing that. And in fact, by Scripture's testimony, we can't do that. So we should take comfort in the fact that you can and do. So uh, give us a hope and, and a desire to see others come to know you through our efforts. And Lord, I pray you'd also bring us back next week after our busy week of, of many activities. Let us continue in this study and let us bring a few others with us if you give us opportunity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.